So we do encourage you to turn on your camera if you feel willing, whatever background and any animals or kids who are popping in or out are perfectly fine. Um, we welcome all of it. Before we welcome you, we want to uh, let you know who we are. My name is Kat. I use she and her pronouns. Um, and I will introduce my team and they can unmute and wave and then you'll be able to tell who's who on the screen more easily. So Raylan. Hiya. Uh, my name is Raylan. I use she her pronouns and I am the movement projects assistant at the Action Alliance. Thanks Raylan. And Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Chow-Reeve. I'm the Youth Engagement Manager at the Action Alliance, and I use she, her pronouns. And Kristen. Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Pritchard. My pronouns are she and her, and I am the Sexual and Reproductive Health Promotion Manager at the Action Alliance. Thanks, Kristen. We um, are really excited to be here with you today. And as preventionists, we really like to start our space with usually things that are really fun, things that you can add to your toolbox as icebreakers, but we're not going to do a lot of those typical ones right now because we're going to focus on sharing tons of them with you in our presentation. So um, another tool that you can add to your toolbox if you'd like is something that um, we'll share with you now. It's um, a welcome that we learned from an organization called Training for Change. A lot of our staff went through it, and it's a way to create a really inclusive welcome. So I want to welcome into the space today all of the complicated and nuanced feelings, the exhaustion, the excitement, the anxiety, the fear, the energy of this health pandemic and this racial justice uprising moment that we're in. I want to welcome people of African descent, Black, African American, Asian descent, Arab descent, European descent, those who identify as Hispanic, Latinx, people indigenous to this land, people of mixed and multiple descents, people of all genders, people who might identify as women, men, transgender, genderqueer, or others, people of different class backgrounds, people who are currently struggling with getting access to resources that are necessary for survival, like healthcare, housing, transportation, and childcare, people who currently have access to those resources, people over there in Washington State, people here in Virginia, somewhere in between, somewhere farther away, people with disabilities, visible or invisible, people who are queer, bisexual, gay, lesbian, pansexual, heterosexual, or others for whom none of those labels fit. We welcome your bodies and the different ways you experience them. We welcome survivors, people who identify as social change activists and people who don't, those who might be single, married, partnered, dating, in monogamous or polyamorous relationships, those who are in their 20s, their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. We welcome your emotions, the joy, the grief, the rage, the bliss, the confusion, and the disappointment. We welcome those who have supported you to be here today, your families, both genetic and chosen, people with different faiths, religious traditions, faith practices, other practices that don't belong to a tradition, atheists, seekers, those who are dear to us who have died, our elders, those here in this room, in our lives, and those who have passed away. We welcome all of you. So that's something that we encourage you to customize, bring into your space, and add to your toolbox um, when you are opening and hosting prevention spaces. Uh, just to give you a really quick um, review of what to expect today. So this is not your typical webinar. This is going to be an interactive space. Um, our team has been doing these type of spaces every two to three weeks for all of our member programs. And we've found that they've been such a valuable place to have discussion and that people are really looking for ways to connect and to process. And so we have really built in a lot of that today. And so what you can expect is that 
Next, Laura will be taking us through some digital facilitation fun, like tips and tricks and tools that you can use. She'll be modeling that. You'll be demoing it with us right here. You'll be learning how to do some of these right now. And then we'll send you to breakout rooms so you can have further discussion about how to use tools in your work, what's working, what are some barriers, and what are some ideas that you can swap. And then we're going to come back all together and Raylan's going to lead us through another presentation about how using art as a social change mechanism and using digital art is such a powerful tool. And then you'll be going into breakout rooms again to have some opportunities with new sets of people potentially to kind of cross pollinate some ideas and gain some energy around this discussion. And then we'll welcome you back into the space all together again to do some quick closings that also use some great online, easy, accessible tools. Um, and we can center our space with um, uh, of an image that we create together about what we're taking away and how we're moving forward. So that is our plan for the next 90 minutes or at this point, 80 minutes. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, of course, please message Michelle in the chat. Um, and we hope that you get to enjoy this space with us today. So Laura, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Kat, and um, thanks, Michelle. Thanks for every for Washington for hosting us and um, for inviting us. I'm going to share my screen really quick. Um, so today we're going to talk about a few tips and tricks um, that I think we're also still really learning. Um, and figuring out in our space. Um, I wanted to do start off with some citations and some resources that I think are really helpful um, for doing this work. Um, Learning Groups Online, which is a free uh, book and PDF that you can download, um, is super helpful, super grounding for me when we first were kind of entering in this pandemic. Definitely like one of my go-to resources when I'm trying to think like not only like like how do I do this online? Like how would I translate things? But also like what are things that we just need to like, um, like what are things we just need to be grounded in, in terms of timing, right? Like who wants to be on a six hour training uh, for a whole day in front of a Zoom screen? Nobody, and that's okay, right? So like also just like, how are we gonna have to like manage expectations? I feel like this uh, resource is really helpful for that. Um, Kat already mentioned Training for Change. They have some really great online resources, um, particularly these like 10 ways to do a spectrogram, some templates for online presentations. Um, and I'm gonna go into more depth on the, what those look like, um, as well as a few that we've created. And also just Canva as like a general really great easy tool. I know probably many of you have used it for social media posts, um, but it actually has lots of really great templates for your online presentations. Um, I know Raylan might, will mention it when we're talking about art. I think there's like ways we can definitely use um, it in an out-of-the-box way. Um, so our first spectrogram was a way we're going to check in with y'all. Um, our prevention team really loves these, um, so we'd love for you to drop in the chat um, a number one through five of which image describes how you're feeling today best. We really like these because you can switch it up. Um, it, uh, Raylan has made some really hilarious meme versions, um, but it's also a way of like checking in with your people without kind of like these over like processing introductions, right? It's a way of kind of just to see where folks are at. And so I see uh, some ones, some twos, some fours, um also so if you're you do have folks who are on the phone who might not be able to see um what is on the screen you can also describe them which um our members really enjoy having to hear me describe especially the memes um but for one it's a very like misty um maybe like a very northwest pacific northwest kind of day i don't know i haven't been there in a minute that's a lie i was there in february but um then number two is more of this like rainbow. Three is a tornado, which is like, you know, I'm welcoming that energy for sure today. Um, four, is that a sunrise or a sunset? Do we know? Nobody knows. We're shaking our heads. Okay. If someone knows, let me know. 
And then five, we have some like really beautiful kind of like golden hour um, flowers, but it looks like we got some folks to check in and it looks like we do have lots of ones, which I'm definitely feeling today. Um, we have folks all over. So again, this is like a really fun tool to kind of see where people are at. It's also, if you do have a smaller group, you can kind of be like, what does that feel like? What is a three feeling like today? Um, right? So if you do want to kind of go more in depth with folks, it also just like kind of creates that platform to do that. The next uh, one we're going to do is where are you zooming in from today? So I'd love for you to actually go up to the top of your screen. You're going to see view options and you're going to click the annotate button and then you're going to click a stamp and then you're able to physically stamp on your screen where you're zooming in from. There we go. We've got it started. I know most of you are from Washington. Oh, but not really. We have folks from all over. So I tried to be as inclusive as possible. I have no idea. I'm going to just be honest where any of these in Washington are going. Um, I'm sure Kat does if she wants to unmute herself and tell us. All right. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of an ambiguous shape, but I'm going to say, I'm guessing we have some folks from Yakima here, maybe Ellensburg, maybe Chehalis, Tacoma, Seattle, Bellingham, maybe Forks. If anyone wants to pop into the chat where you are, you can check me. And then we also have some folks across the U.S., definitely some folks in Virginia, Maine? I'm going to say Maine, right? That's Maine. <laughs> I'm not even going to do this right now. This is too embarrassing. Listen. Hey, Laura, will you review for folks how to annotate again? Yes. So you're going to go up to the top of your screen and you should see a view options button and you're going to click that and then a few things are going to pop down and then you should see an annotate button. And then when you are in annotate, I would recommend, so after you do your stamp, you'll then want to click the mouse option. Otherwise, you're going to annotate anywhere you click on your screen, um, which might have happened to this uh, lone star at the bottom. Um, but again, I welcome that. I welcome this star. Um, and I welcome learning together. Um, great. So, and another great thing that we love about uh, the annotate feature is that it's anonymous, right? So not necessarily for this question is this needs to be anonymous, but if you do have other questions, like some of the ones we have um, with maybe your coworkers or just youth you're working with or just community members who might not want to be totally like, yeah, that's me, right? Like there's ways in which they can engage and you can see where folks are at without them having to explicitly say that. Um, you can also use these as, you know, data tools, evaluation tools, right? You can save these. Um, these can be helpful things you put in your reports of like, oh, look who's coming to our virtual sessions, right? There's lots of ways you can use that. Because I'm a co-host, I'm able to see this save button, which very easily saves screenshots of all these images. And then I'm also able to clear all of our drawings so we can move to the next slide. Um, and I hope you'll understand that we're doing kind of like a meta facilitation right now, right? Um, and I might have to get actually out of annotate to, there we go. So we're really curious, how long have you been doing prevention work? Um, especially since we don't know many of you. So if you want to do that annotate feature one more time. So we'll see all the way on the right, we have 10 plus years. Um, all the way on the left, we have just started, but we'd love to see where you kind of exist in this spectrum. Um, and again, these are called spectrograms. They're really a great way of kind of allowing folks to kind of show you where they exist on a spectrum. We're not, not wanting to rely heavily on binaries. Um, but it looks like we do have some 10 plus years, folks. That's awesome. A lot of hovering kind of in between that one year to five years. Um, but we do have some folks in six months. I know that in Virginia, we have some folks who were hired like right as the pandemic started as preventionists. Um, so we know that like that is an experience people are having right now. And that is like a really hard way to start a new job, especially one in prevention, right? Um, so 
that's really exciting to kind of see that range and also exciting for our breakout rooms, right, that we're going to be able to see uh, um, people will be able to talk to folks with all different types of experiences. Um, so unless I'm not really looking at the chat, so y'all let me know if I'm missing anything important or any questions, but I'm going to clear these drawings one more time and we're going to go to the next question. So what's your prevention capacity? And so I made this in Canva. Um, so again, just wanting to show the different ways you can use Canva. You can use those other types of backgrounds, the more natural ones, but we can also use some of their cool images. I do think that a professional um, paid account in Canva is worth the money um, just because of the things you can do. It's really not that expensive. Um, but anyway, so wondering if you're one of multiple full-time employees, if you're on a prevention island and you're the, the only person um, who's full-time, if you're also not even a full-time person, you have a half-time FTE, um, a quarter, or if you're not currently funded to prevention. Um, because we do know, um, especially here in Virginia, and I'm sure also that's true in your state of that, you know, it really varies of like where folks um, are funded to do prevention. Um, and that we're definitely trying, especially here in Virginia, trying to get more funds for prevention so we can see more folks in our state do the work. But we see, so we have like quite a few over here folks in uh, multiple FTEs, which is exciting. Y'all are in this cute little dance party. We have a few, um, again, prevention islands is what we call it in Virginia. And then also we have some folks who are kind of half time or quarter time. And we have um, a few folks who aren't currently funded to do prevention. Great. Oh, nope. Didn't want to do that. Nope. Mm -mm. There we go. Um, you y'all got a quick um, sneak peek. So we're going to clear all your drawings. And again, Zoom is weird. Sometimes things happen where you show your slides and you're not ready to, and that's okay. So, and then sometimes they don't come up again. There we go. So this is another different type of spectrogram. Again, don't love binaries. So although this is like a comfortable and uncomfortable question, we tried to create some overlap. So folks could kind of name like, I'm comfortable, but I'm at the edge of comfort, right? Like we wanted folks to be able to kind of be able to feel that way. So how comfortable do you feel about having conversations with your community about healthy sexuality? Um, and that folks could put themselves snap dab and com comfortable all the way to the right and comfortable. But as we see, we can have folks kind of sit in that middle area, um, understanding um, that that's where people are at. And again, I think a question like this might be <laughs> amazing. Uh, yes, please use all the annotate features. Um, that things like this might be helpful. Um, gauging folks' capacity, gauging folks' willingness and readiness to do certain things. But it looks like Washington overall is pretty comfy with talking about healthy sexuality with their communities. Um, and also this just breaks it up, right? We want to use different shapes. Um, we want to just make sure folks have, you know, are like not looking at the same thing over and over again. Um, and you might have different questions that are better suited for this kind of format. Um, oops, I forgot to clear it. There we go. So, this one is fun. Um, we have some X and Y axes. Um, don't ask me which is which. I mean, I think I know, but whatever. We won't talk about it. But this is a way to kind of see, like, uh, more in-depth uh, ways in uh, which folks uh, can answer just like more nuanced conversations, right? So we're going to ask you again to use that annotate feature of your agency's uh, capacity or readiness to do primary, uh, to do community level primary prevention. So we can see, okay, I'm going to need Kat to you to tell me the axes. Oh, I don't remember. Okay, so this vertical line. X is it, the bottom. X is horizontal. this one. Why is this way? Wow, I'm so glad this is recorded. So on the y-axis, we have most staff have a deep understanding of community level prevention. 
to the bottom, which most staff do not have a deep understanding of community prevention. And then on the left and right, we have our agency does not have a plan for community level prevention. And then a right uh, to the right where y'all are already implementing something, right? So maybe like a lot of your staff have an understanding of community level prevention, that that is something very much integrated into the way y'all are thinking about your work, but you don't currently have a plan, um, then you'd want to be up here to the left corner, which we already see we have an X, amazing, beautiful. And then let's say that like you, most staff do not understand primary prevention, but you've already implemented a strategy, right? So like that is gonna tell us something else, right? And that might show us that, oh, so like not everyone on staff has this deep understanding. So it probably means one or two staff people are the ones that are really like holding this big like load of uh, doing community level prevention, um, right? Versus some folks who are saying like a lot of our staff do and we're implementing, then that might tell us that more, more staff, there's more capacity, there's more buy-in, right? So it just kind of lets us see um, the nuances in these conversations. Um, and so this one is fun and y'all got to see that I wasn't a math person in school. It looks like Laura is just really temporarily frozen, which is another one of the really fun things that happens with all of these online and Zoom trainings. So she will be able to share her screen in just a minute again, and then we can pick back up. Can you hear me? Great. The internet um, hates me. It's just so tired right now. So many of us are on it. But that's okay because uh, we've got a different type of spectrogram that I wanted to show you. Um, so these are actually directly from Training for Change. So just wanted to name that. Um, and so this is really great for your small groups um, where if you actually don't want it to be anonymous and you want folks to be able to edit with you, what you would do is Google Slides is one of the best versions of that. You would share the link, right, that anyone with a link can edit. And then folks can actually be in here and then they can say like, oh, whatever question was, how much do you like ice cream? Laura loves ice cream and so I'm gonna go over here, right? And so other folks can put their names. Um, and so again, this is just another uh, way of, we're actually not wanting to be anonymous in this question and we want folks to be able to actually interact with the slides. Um, then another one that's more interactive is this one. So. I know that many of you, when you're facilitating, we love a circle, we love to be able to see everyone. Um, so this is also one way to kind of mimic that online, where you would actually put people's names. Um, you can have people put their names, again, by sharing that link. Um, you can, uh, and then this is also a nice way to have that kind of circle vibe. Um, when like you're doing go arounds, right? Cause it's awkward, not everyone sees the same people. So if you have this up, you're gonna be able to be like, oh, this is the circle we're sitting in. Um, Training for Change also has this option or this suggestion that I really like of putting something in the middle, like an image that's grounding you, maybe offering, um, if you kind of wanna cr create that kind of sacred healing space. Um, this is just another easy way to be like, oh, this is to feel grounded of this is who I'm in the room with even though we're, we can't physically be there. Um, and then one last, the last one, definitely the last one, is um, using these sticky notes. So again, if we, if you have less people, um, I mean, 40 isn't that bad. I've seen folks use it with more, but we're not gonna do that quite yet, just in terms of time. Um, but you'd be able to have folks edit things. So again, I know you're, we, I love sticky notes in my facilitation. I love when folks are able to put them up and then we're able to um, kind of move them and group them. You can do all of that virtually. So we are asking this question of what are practices that have felt grounding in this current time. Um, and one of my colleagues is gonna read off from the chat 
and I can edit these. So if you want to drop that into the chat, which is also another way to facilitate this. Yeah, and as you guys start to populate those ideas, I can read them to Laura and she can start typing them on there and then we'll have that collection. So again, what practices have felt grounding in this time in both pandemic and racial uprising? We have walking the dog over lunch. Deep breathing. Music. Going outside. Coffee breaks. Brief walks. Cooking, baking. Virtual check-ins. Meditation. Gardening. Crafting. Working out. Calling your person. So these are great, right? And so you also saw how I started grouping them. Um, if y'all have ever done dot voting, have y'all done that before? Right, um, you could do that here, right? So we could, if you all would be willing to open your annotate feature and then actually annotate, um, put a little star next to some of the ones that maybe you didn't say, but you've been doing as well. Exactly. So then we're able to not only create this document together, but then we're also able to see all the different ways in which we're in agreement or disagreement or have been using similar coping mechanisms or just grounding practices. Awesome. Thank you. This is great. Um, and again, so you can do it the way that we did it, where Kat is reading to me and I'm able to put them in together, but you can also share that link. And so then folks can actually type it in and then um, you can actually see folks engaging with the um, practice as well. Um, oh, forgot to change it to my mouse. Um, so I'm going to clear all of these drawings. And then we're actually gonna go to these breakout questions, which we're also gonna put in the chat for you um, before we send you off. Um, but the questions that we have for today um, are, what did you find helpful about these online facilitation strategies? How could you use them for your programming, but also for your staff meetings, whatever you're kind of needing them for? Uh, what questions or concerns about online facilitation do you have? Um, you can brainstorm with each other. What other activities do you think uh, could tran be translated online based on these tools? And also something that we often think of, what values do you want to bring into your online facilitation? For example, an anti-oppressive uh, trauma-informed facilitation style, and what does that actually look like online for you? Um, and so again, if um, have those been dropped in the chat? Yes, they have. Thank you, Kristen. Um, and yeah, Michelle, I think we're good to go. Cool. Um, so we're going to talk through um, digital art and organizing, especially in this time of protest and social distance. So we have like two major pandemics going on. Um, and so we want to address that in the work that we're doing. And the art you see on the screen, um, we will include all the artists work in this. So you can go check them out yourself and maybe use them and promote them. Um, on your own social media pages. So it says, free them all and may tomorrow bring us more justice and some peace. So first we're gonna at, talk about why is art integral to movements? So Micah Bazant states, cultural work opens crucial space to dream bigger and envision the world. 
um, art invites people in and often makes our work more accessible um, because you don't have words as a barrier. Um, and so it's open and available to um, different abilities, uh, different languages, images uh, can act universal in this way. Um, and also it is, uh, can be joyful and playful. So it can really tap into making things lighter, being able to funnel our feelings and our movement work into something visual and something really beautiful that we can share with others. Um, and besides just the healing aspect and what it does for us internally, it can also be a call to action as we're seeing like with protest signs, um, murals all over, I'm sure happening across the country. And art can be a call to action uh, and illustrate our demands. Um, and so this image that we have here, um, I'll briefly describe. Last year we hosted a creative expression social justice youth retreat and we had a graphic designer, uh, not graphic designer, goodness gracious, graphic facilitator and graphic note taker. And I'll talk more about that practice. But our young people, uh, we pose this question to them of why do movements need art? Um, and these were their responses and Emily Simons um, was able to capture their responses and make it into this beautiful graphic. So it's always something fun to return to. You can kind of see the way the conversation went. Um, sometimes it can be a lot easier than like a Word document with bullet points and trying to go over that conversation. Um, and also it's just really beautiful to look at. Um, some of these responses, like we said, uh, words are limited. Symbols hold layers of meaning and power. Um, they bring us play and joy. It's a rallying cry. Protests becomes art. Art is a way to mitigate burnout and nourishes our humanity. So we really want to emphasize that twofold of it's a healing practice, but also a tool for social change. And I think holding both of those things are really important. Um, yeah. So a question um, that you can either put in the chat um, and someone can read them out if uh, one of the action line staff can read them out. Um, what are examples of art being used during this moment of national uprising struggle for black liberation that you have seen? So some examples I have here and I included the people's ats at the bottom. Um, their ats are for Instagram. So each one serves a, a slightly different purpose in the work that it's doing. So we first have this beautiful graphic that says make Juneteenth a national holiday. Um, and so it's bringing awareness to, um, it's promoting this and it can promote a lot of questions and things that might not just be ca captured in the graphic could also be like posted in the comment section um, and can get a conversation going. Um, this next image is of Brianna Taylor um, and this is, also acting as a call to action on you know how people are demanding justice in whatever way that may look like for black people who have been killed by police brutality but it's also a way of honoring and depicting um, we often see black pain and black suffering nationalized on tv so it's this really beautiful way of honoring the full humanity of her um, which is really beautiful to see um, and then this last graphic says watch as we rise um, and so it has like images of like imperialism ending. So you see the burning flags, you see our young people leading us in these movements. We see moments of resistance. So this can also be a call to action in its way of inspiring us. Um, so they all function a little differently, but um, they're all bringing awareness in different ways to this current movement. Um, is there anything in the chat that I can't see that anyone wants to read out? Um, we have a few, because they're people's like, a whole hand, like handles, I don't know how to pronounce them all, but yes, there is a person who does amazing data visualization that makes data more accessible, which we love. We're here for that. Um, check out that person's Instagram handle. We have another person on um, Insta who makes beautiful hand-painted jewelry. Um, in Minneapolis, a lot of the properties that were boarded up were covered up with murals. Um, and it's been a beautiful way to show that all of the pain in the community is being transformed into action and hope. 
um, yeah, so we also see ways in which it's not just digital, um, but right. also other types of Yeah. Work. Uh, thank you all so much for sharing. And it's also like any art form is valid in this time. You see all these works, three works I'm showing are vastly different, but they all accomplish something different and they're really beautiful. So like more if like type text is more your thing, like design, if you're more of an illustrator, if you're more of a paint, like whatever your art form and practice is or those you engage with can really be helpful to um, your community. Um, so examples, again, some more examples of specific programs and ways that you could um, do work and tie in art from the very beginning. And so like the artists are creating with you in your programming and your goals for that program. Um, so this is called the Free Our Mothers, Sisters and Queens um, project and it's a poster series. Um, I'm just going to read so I don't mess up the orgs. Uh, goals and the work that they do. So this is from an uh, organization called the People's Paper Co-op. And so it's a woman-led and focused and powered art and advocacy project in Northern Philly. Um, they look to women in re-entry as the leading experts on criminal justice and what society needs to hear from and use art to amplify their stories, dreams, and visions for a more just and free world. So this project is in collaboration with the Philadelphia Community Bail Fund on their Mama's Day bailout um, campaign. And so what they do is they work with artists who create works in conjunction with people who have been criminalized or their survivorship has been criminalized. And so what they did is made these beautiful posters and normally they have something different for the campaign, but due to COVID, they had to adapt. And so they made these beautiful posters, which people can buy and all the proceeds go to the bail fund. So it's just another example of like ways that like, yes, you could use something on social media as like an infographic, but you can also use artwork to um, promote survivors, their stories. And also they're using it as like a fundraising method in order to um, bail out their mothers, sisters, and queens. Um, another example um, of some programming you could use with your digital art. Um, so there was a Zoom uh, art making event. So it, everyone was able to come together digitally, um, just more ways you can adapt during times of COVID. And so the goal was to create art for abolition uh, with hashtag free survivors. So um, people would come together on a Zoom and just create together and be in community together. Um, something we really like to do is like art builds and that can be hard during these times. Um, so like you can create that space virtually and digitally and just being intentional about how you're gonna use that space. Um, it's also super helpful if you have the resources. I know some groups and organizations are sending out like art kits. So say you're working with a group of young people and you want to do something together. If you have the means or resources, you can send like poster paper or pick like color pencils or whatever you all want to work on and build together. And you can all come into the virtual space together and create based off of what you have or something we're doing with our young people is like our prompt today is how do we honor nature or like let's make art for black liberation together and if people feel comfortable um, we can share our work together and see what we're all working on so that's a really nice inviting space that we can all come together um, and something the action alliance is doing um, so we're working on building up our social media. Um, so these are kind of infographics, also things that are inspiring or central to the work that we're doing in our movement work. Um, so the graphics we have here are the connections between the carceral system and gender-based violence and how they both replicate power and control. Um, and we did these things in part with during Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, so there's kind of just like awareness, kind of like an awareness campaign and getting people 
aware of these issues during this month. Um, other ways to take action and talking about primary prevention, which we all love. Um, and then this beautiful quote, a future without violence is a future without youth prisons. Um, and it's really great when you're working with and partner with other organizations, you can bring together your goals in really beautiful ways. Um, and I also want to just bring up that these were created by our wonderful, talented, amazing, show-stopping Laura. <laughs> so yeah, check her out. Um, and so I brought this up earlier with the graphic um, that we got from our honeycomb retreat, but graphic recording, also known as graphic facilitation or graphic note taking. Um, there are some discrepancies with that. Facilitation is like the person holds the role of both facilitator and note taker. Um, graphic note taker, sometimes they're just in space um, and just taking notes um, while you all are having a conversation. So they can look a little bit different um, depending on what your needs are. Um, but this has really been booming since COVID. Um, and so it's a way for people to engage in multiple ways. So you could hold a program or a space on Zoom and invite a graphic note taker in and they can kind of take your conversation and turn it into these very, very beautiful things that people can reflect back on. Um, and it engages in multiple ways. So people are having the conversation, but they can also be, if the graphic note taker wishes to share their screen, they can see this beautiful thing being built as well. So it's multiple ways to engage. Um, and it's always great to look back to, you're like, oh, what did we talk about last year? And you can follow your conversation and things that were brought into the space. So it's really, really beautiful and great to see um, two of these are from Training for Change, um, and they're going over some of the things that we talked about earlier. So the online techniques um, that we talk through, um, they're breaking it down there. Um, some goals for facilitating online meetings, um, and there's also a graphic from the Rising Majority. So we just wanna name some best practices when creating movement art or working with artists that you wanna commission to create um, digital art or movement art. Um, it's really important to build relationships over transactions. So not just having the artist come in at the end and you dictate like, this is what we're gonna do and this is already what we have in mind, but really having them, if you can and are able to, having them involved in your brainstorming process seeing what their abilities are, what capacity they have, what they're interested in making as well, really coming together and having that relationship instead of just like, this is our rate, just make something off of the thing we already have planned out. So really making sure involvement is from the beginning to the very end. Also with pay, just be transparent and upfront and pay your artists. Um, it's like a running joke online that people think that like artists want to get paid for promotion and it's like no people need to get paid to do their work and it's important to honor and value that work and see that what they're doing is equally as important to the work that we do and they can work in tandem um, so paying your artists um, and being transparent is very important again always credit their work um, I'm sure during this time where everyone is on social media we're all seeing like the same things on rotation on Instagram stories. You're like, where did this come? Like, I wanna refer back to this, like, where did this come from? And so it can be so easy if you see something related to the work to like wanna share it on your page without giving credit. Um, but it's always really a good practice to do that so other people um, can connect with them as well. Um, when possible and based on the needs of the space include image descriptions um, and that's a practice that we're honestly still leaning into and trying to learn um, and I think you just giving yourself time and space to do that um, is really important for access needs um, be ready to receive feedback shift course be accountable and challenge norms um, which is really important uh, you have to meet your community where they are um, 
and if and the art should also reflect that and what you're doing um, be collaborative and cooperative so like if it's possible open it up and share it with your staff share it with your young people and get input um, especially your young people because they love to be involved in those things and like seeing their own work reflected in the things that you promote as an organization is always super empowering and feels really good um, so be open to open your process a little bit um, also we touched on yeah this is a very much a time of pain and suffering and that that is real and all those feelings are valid but it's also really beautiful to show what other world is possible um, so like the work of um, that said, watch as we rise, it's showing a world that they're dreaming of, a world without imperialism, a world there where youth are leaders and all those things. So it's really empowering to show um, something like that involves radical um, imagination. And then just two quick things to consider, who is your audience um, and what is your goal and what do you want the viewer to do? Do you want them to just follow your page? Do you want them to donate somewhere? Do you want them just to have awareness? So always have that goal in mind as well. And just some organizing strategies and the different ways that you can use it. Uh, protests and actions. So like a sign making get together could be really awesome if you all socially distance and have your mask on um accessible political education resources so like maybe something breaking down like what is prevention uh social media campaigns like the action alliance did for sexual assault awareness month um and public art that shifts narratives and public discourse so like someone brought up er earlier murals are really great um because they have a wide wide audience so and last but not least um how to start even like begin this process if you're not working with local artists or local art advocacy orgs. Um, we mentioned Canva and Canva is fantastic. Um, this image that you see was made on Canva uh, by Action Line staff. So that can be a really great way to start, especially you have tons of images, tons of text that you can mess around and play with. Um, and yeah, that's a really, really great resource. Reach out to local artists and art organizations. Um, we often say like, we don't have to own all the work. So really reach out to people in your community and that's a really great way to build relationships that you wouldn't have otherwise. Um, if you have the means to, um, at your office, upload paintings, drawings, sketches. So phys taking physical work and uploading them can be really awesome. Um, and even it can be as simple as social media. So like playing around with Instagram stories and creating fun gifts that are also calls to action can be really great. So these can just be places to start. So that is all I have before you all go out into breakout rooms. And we just have some questions for you to consider. How can you incorporate art in a meaningful way in your work, programming, prevention work, what about digital art excites you? What barriers do you have? Um, and what do you think the role of digital art has been during this moment of COVID and resistance? And any other general questions as well?